we find ourselves in Psalms 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. You know, I hope you're amazed at what God does for us each and every day. And as we sing to the Lord, let's go ahead and sing. Come Christians, join to sing. We'll go ahead and stand as we sing. Come Christians, join to sing. Come Christian, join to sing. Alleluia. Amen. Loud praise to Christ our King. Alleluia. Amen. Let all with heart and voice before His throne rejoice. Praises His gracious choice. Alleluia, amen. Come, lift your hearts on high. Alleluia, amen. Let praises fill the sky. Alleluia, amen. He is our guide and friend. To us he'll God and say, his love shall never end. Alleluia. It said his love shall never end. That should make you happy. That should make you glad. Let's sing praise yet our Christian again on the last. Praise yet our Christ again. Alleluia. Amen. Love shall not end the Father, we do bow before you this morning. We are here to worship you, to worship your Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the privilege we have of joining together in worship. Lord, we just ask that you would accept our worship today. May it be acceptable in your sight. May it be a pleasing nostril to you, a pleasing odor in your nostrils, Lord, as your word says. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be right before you, that we'd worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we think of those who have recently lost loved ones, and we pray that you would bring comfort to them. Lord, we know that there are needs in each and every heart that is in, a, in our service this morning. Father, as we lift these needs before you in prayer, we just know that you know us, we know that you love us, we know that you care. And Father, we just ask that you would work in each life according to your perfect will. Challenge our hearts today. Glorify yourself in our lives. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. My last song, you might, might be looking next door to your neighbor um, in your pew and saying, why would you be able to praise the Lord? If you knew what was going on in my life, man, it would be hard to sing praises to God. And I think the reason why that person could do that is because they found out that our God is full of grace. And as the song says here, he giveth power, Isaiah says, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increased strength. Let's go ahead as we sing, he giveth more grace. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To hand of affliction, he handeth his mercy. To multiply trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we have exhausted our 
Let's go ahead and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we realize how much you give to us, let us come to you in humble adoration of what you do for us each and every day. Even as we um, think of just your provision throughout the week, throughout the year, we ask that we just give it back a portion of what you have entrusted to us. We ask that we use the money wisely to serve you more here in Wellington and throughout the world. We pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. Thank you so much. If you have noticed, there's been a progression of the theme of song. We praise our Lord and because he can give more grace. And you know what? If we struggle with that, we should ask him to open our eyes. Let's go ahead and sing, open my eyes that I may see. Let's go ahead and stand. Junior church, you are dismissed. Let's sing, open my eyes that I may see. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands a wonderful key that shall unclamps and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes and illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warmth truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my heart and this time we have a 
Christmas special. Thank you so much, Julia. Isn't that the best news you could ever hear? Jesus saves. We have a world filled with people who need that message. And it's our job to get that message to them. Jesus saves. Thank you so very much. Psalm 119 is not only the longest psalm, it's also the longest chapter in the whole Bible. In its 176 verses, the psalmist uses 10 different terms or titles for the Word of God. In fact, each of those 176 verses contain at least one of those 10 titles, except for three verses. Verse 90, verse 122, and verse 132. In Psalm 1, by the way, don't turn there this morning. We're not going to be there. In verse 18 of Psalm 119, the psalmist records a brief but very important prayer. It's a prayer that should be on our lips or in our hearts every time we approach the Word of God. Listen to what he prays in Psalm 119, verse 18. He prays this. Open my eyes 
that I may see wondrous things from your law. This book, our Bible, is God's book. God wrote it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So it only makes sense that it is only through the ministry of the same Holy Spirit that we can understand it. The psalmist is teaching us to pray, open our eyes, Lord, when we come to the word of God. Open the eyes of our minds so that we can see and understand wonderful and awesome things from the word of God. The Bible is also a spiritual book. It contains spiritual truth. So it's only with spiritual insight that we can truly understand what it has to say. We need for God to open our spiritual eyes so we can comprehend the spiritual truths that he wants us to be aware of. There's a story in the Old Testament about Elisha and his servant. The story is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. I want to share that story with you as we begin our message this morning. Now again, don't turn there. I'm going to be reading from 2 Kings chapter 6 starting with verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Now this is Elijah sending a message to the king of Israel to warn him about the king of Syria. All right, He sent a message saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him. And he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So over and over again, these plans are being thwarted. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. He called together his servants and said to them, Which, I mean, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? I've got a spy. I've got a mole. Somebody is telling the king of Israel what we're going to do. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words you speak in your bedroom. Talk about somebody being bugged. <laughs> so he said, the king of Syria, Go and see where, it is, where he is that I may send and get him. I'm going to take care of this guy. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Now God had warned Elijah about but the Syrians, don't you think you would have warned him about this? So Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now the servants looking out, we're surrounded, it's a huge army, what are you talking about? And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and, char horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. We need to have our eyes opened to the spiritual truths in God's word, just like Elisha's servant needed to have his spiritual eyes open to see God's protection of the army of angels ready to protect Elisha. You know, the Apostle Paul prayed something very similar in Ephesians chapter 1. Take your Bibles if you would. Turn with me to the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. We're making our way through this letter. There is an outline in your bulletin that will help you as we study our passage this morning. Paul has just finished a lengthy sentence discussing the riches that are ours in Christ Jesus. Now he turns to God in prayer. And this prayer is another long sentence. It covers all nine verses of today's passage. In this prayer, Paul prays for spiritual understanding for the church, for the believers at Ephesus. 
He wants God to open their eyes to all that they have in Christ. And that prayer applies to us. Let's see what kinds of things we should be seeing. We'll begin by reading our passage, Ephesians chapter 1, starting with verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Paul's writing this letter to the believers in Ephesus to encourage them and to teach them some additional spiritual truth. In this letter, we'll, you'll find two rather lengthy prayers, the one we just read, and then another later in chapter 3. In today's prayer, Paul prays very specifically for open eyes and spiritual understanding for the church at Ephesus. When's the last time you prayed that prayer? <laughs> Let's see what kinds of things we need to understand and how we should be praying for one another and for ourselves in our church today. We'll begin with Paul's praise for the believers in verses 15 and 16. Look at verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. As we begin this morning, we need to take note that Paul regularly prays for the churches that he is familiar with. We find this over and over in his letters. In verse 16, we hear Paul's testimony. He doesn't cease giving thanks and praying for the church at Ephesus. Paul regularly prays for the churches. So right here at the beginning of the passage, we have a very important message or lesson for us today. We need to be faithful in our prayers for our church for its members. We need to be praying regularly, not only for our own church, but other churches, other believers that we're aware of. Prayer is a very important ministry in and to the church. Are we doing our part? As we read Paul's letters, we find that he regularly prays for the churches and for individual believers. Now, we'll look at the specifics of Paul's prayer in just a moment. But before we do, we need to notice that when Paul prays, he also regularly thanks God for these churches. Paul says he doesn't cease to give thanks for the church and for the believers that are a part of it. Why does he thank God? Well, notice the words, after I heard. What had Paul heard about this church that caused him to give thanks? What is their reputation? There are two different things that Paul had heard about this church. He had heard about their faith in Christ. He had heard about their love. Notice the objects of these qualities. Paul had heard about their reputation for faith in Christ. That faith deals with their vertical relationship. He heard that they had faith in Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of people have faith in themselves. Their abilities, their strength, their knowledge, their education, their personality, their position in life. Other people have a lot of faith in their finances, money in the bank, investments, possessions like a nice home. 
Some people have a lot of faith in science and scientists. We're hearing that a lot today. Or faith in the government, or faith in educators, or faith in the media. A lot of people don't have faith in any of those, right? But the only faith that really counts is faith in Jesus Christ. We must get that vertical relationship right. We're saved by grace through faith. But the object of our faith is vital. Our faith must be in Jesus Christ and in his finished work on the cross. These believers had a reputation for a strong faith in Christ. That would begin with saving faith. But it would also include ongoing, day-by-day -day living faith. So let me ask you, what about you? Do you have that vertical relationship right? Do you have saving faith in Christ? The saving faith that makes a person a real Christian? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And if you have, are you trusting Christ every day? People who know you, do they see you as a person that has a reputation for faith in Christ? He's in control. I can believe him. This church in Ephesus had its vertical relationship right. They had faith in Christ. But it also had a reputation of love for all saints. That deals with a horizontal relationship or horizontal relationships. Vertical, faith in Christ, horizontal love for all the saints. And their love was toward all the saints. Not just family. Not just their best friends, not just the people they liked or those that were nearby. They were known for their love of all believers. So these Christians in Ephesus, they got it right. In their vertical relationship, they were known for their faith in Christ. In their horizontal relationships, the relationships that are here on this earth, they were known for their love for all the saints. We need to realize faith and love go together. True believers will demonstrate love toward other believers. This was a church that had a reputation, and that reputation was for faith and love. Now, that means that their faith and their love must have been demonstrated through practical actions. There are probably things about you that I don't know and nobody else knows. So you don't have a reputation for those things. If this faith, if this love was only inward and hidden, no, they wouldn't have a reputation. It was outward. It was something that people could see. It caused a reputation. Paul heard a report about this church, and it was a report that praised their faith and their love. They were actively demonstrating faith and love in their church, in their assembly. You know, it's a good question for us to ask ourselves, what reputation does our church have? What do others hear about us? What are we known for? I hope that our faith and sharing that faith, and I hope that our love have formed a good reputation for us as well. I hope that your faith in Christ, your love for others, create a positive reputation for you individually. So Paul opens this long sentence with a word of praise for these believers. But the remainder of the passage today deals with Paul's prayer for these believers. Let's take a look. We'll start at the end of verse 16. He says, I'm making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, Paul's prayer in the book of Ephesians is rather different from our prayers today. When we pray, we oftentimes share some worship, some praise of God. But then we tend to focus on 
others and their health needs, their financial needs, relationship needs, many other things. In today's prayer, Paul has just one request. And that single request is for understanding. A single request. The prayer, this prayer by the Apostle Paul centers around one major request. It's not a request for good health. It's not a request for financial provision. It's not even a request for the gospel to be spread in this case. His request in this passage is for spiritual understanding. In verse 17, we find the request for wisdom. Paul prays that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In verse 18, he asks that their understanding would be enlightened. The word wisdom is the common Greek word for wisdom. It refers to insight into the true nature of things. The word revelation deals with the unveiling of something. In this passage, it's the unveiling of insight into the knowledge of God. He wants these believers to have God unveiled in their lives in a greater way. He wants them to know God better. He prays that their spiritual eyes would be enlightened, they, enlightened that they would be illuminated more and more about their God. We know a lot about God, don't we? Some of you have been saved a very long time. If we started asking questions, what can you tell me about God? I'm sure we could say a lot of things. But Paul prays that we would get to know him even better. So his single request is for wisdom, for understanding. Where does this wisdom come from? What is the source of this wisdom? Well, if you look at the beginning of verse 17, you'll find that the source of wisdom is none other than God himself. Paul is praying that God would give these believers wisdom and open their eyes of understanding into himself. James, the human half-brother of Jesus Christ, wrote this in James 1.5. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. Where do we need to go for wisdom? We go to God. Solomon wrote something very similar back in Proverbs chapter 2. In verse 6 he wrote, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And of course, his mouth we find written in Scripture. So God is the source of wisdom. We find that wisdom. He provides that wisdom through his word. The Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So Paul is praying for these believers. We need to be praying for one another to have more wisdom from God through his word. That's the source of wisdom. But before we move on, I'd like for you to notice how Paul describes God. He is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, a title that Paul had used earlier in verse 3. After the resurrection, Jesus told Mary that he must ascend to my God and your God. There is only one true God. He's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he's also our God. Paul continues by calling him the Father of glory, the one to whom all glory belongs, the glorious Father, the glorious God of the universe, is the source that we need to look to for wisdom. What is the purpose of the wisdom in this verse? Well, again in verse 17, Paul prays that God would give us wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. There's a couple, three New Testament words for knowledge. This is one that refers to experiential knowledge, full knowledge, complete knowledge. How many of you ever learned to ride a bike? Most everybody. I'm understanding this is probably how you did it. You, you got a book on bike riding. And you read that book over and over again. And then you went on YouTube and you watched six videos on how to ride a bike. 
And then you just went out and did it, right? No. You learned by experience. The experience of falling over and skidding your knees, probably. There is head knowledge and then there is experiential knowledge. The knowledge that Paul is talking about is experiencing God. We're not talking about knowledge about God. We're talking about knowing God himself. We're talking about fellowshipping with him, communing with him. That knowledge starts with knowing God for salvation. In Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 3, he prayed, And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You can know a lot about God. Satan knows a lot about God. The demons know a lot about God. But do you know God? Is he your Savior? That's the foundation starting point. But once we know him for salvation, we need to continue to grow in our knowledge of him. The Apostle Peter closed his second letter with these words, 2 Peter 3.18, but grow, or literally keep on growing, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Keep on growing in the knowledge of our Savior. We need to know Jesus. We need to know God better and better. The prophet Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 9, 24, but let him who glories glory in this. I'm going to pause there. If, if I asked you to brag about something, what would you brag about? Are you a good golfer? Are you a good fisherman? Are you a good electrician? Are you a good musician? Do you have some trophies at home from when you were in school and you ran track or you played on a team? What would you brag about? J Jeremiah says, if you want to brag, brag about this. Let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Our kids, our teens years ago, used to be involved in a quiz league. And they would study portions of Scripture. They would memorize portions of Scripture. And they would have a quiz off against other churches. And overall, they did pretty well. I think they even got in a second place trophy once. I'd have to look back at the records and see exactly how well we ultimately ever did. But we're not talking about that kind of head quizzing knowledge, you know, like can you do Jeopardy on Bible. We're talking about knowing God. Paul prays that we might gain wisdom and enlightenment in knowing God, our God, better. He's not referring to theoretical seminary knowledge. He's talking about experiencing God in our lives. He's talking about walking with God day in and day out like Enoch did. The Apostle John informs us that one test of how well we know our God is how well we obey him. Paul is praying for the believers in Ephesus. And his prayer applies to us as well. He prays for one general request, that we would know our God better. Do you need to do that? I need to do that. We're never, we never arrive, do we? We need to know our God better. But that single request is followed by three specific requests for understanding. What is it about God that we need to know better? What is it that, how do we further what Paul is saying? What are the specific requests? The first is that we might know the hope of his calling. Look at verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know... What is the hope of his calling? And then he goes on. We'll stop right there. The hope of his calling. 
three specific requests are related to actually three different time references. The hope of his calling deals with the past. This is something that happened in the past. So what is it that Paul wants us to know, to understand better about God? Well, the words of his, the words translated his calling refer to our salvation and its outworking in our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. See, this is the past. We studied a couple of weeks ago some very deep theology in chapter 1. God called us. 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the hope of his calling has to do with our salvation. He took those of us who were dead, all of us have been there. He took us who were dead in our trespasses and sins. We had no spiritual life. We were living in Satan's realm, the realm of darkness. He made us his children, gave us spiritual life, and caused us to walk in the light. That's his calling. So what's the hope? Well, the word for hope isn't something that we wish for. I hope the Browns can make it all the way next year. That's a wish for kind of thing, right? I hope next year I have to struggle with, do we have church or not on Sunday night because of the Super Bowl, because the Browns are in it, right? Is that an uncalled for wish? You can answer that yourself. I know some of you are fans of other teams. Sorry for you. That's not the kind of hope we're talking about here. This hope is an assurance of the eternal fulfillment of all of God's promises to us who believe. The hope of his calling means the confidence in his calling. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, talking about God, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God saves us and he's going to bring us all the way to glory. 1 John chapter 3 the first three verses, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. What is heaven exactly going to be like? How old will we be in heaven? What will those bodies be like? What will we be able to do in those glorious bodies, glorified bodies? We don't know those things, but we know that when he, Jesus Christ, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now get verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him. That's our hope. One day we're going to be just like Christ. Everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Jesus is coming back. And when he does, in an instant, we're going to be changed to be like him. That's a glorious hope. That's another indication of our eternal security. John writes that hope should motivate us to holy living today. So, a general request that we could know God better now has some specific requests of exactly what it is we need to know. The first is the hope of his calling. We learned earlier in the chapter that God chose us before salva for salvation before the world was ever created. He chose us, he called us, now we are his children. The next specific request of Paul's is that we might understand the riches of his inheritance in the saints. That request looks to the future. The hope looks back to the past. He called us, made us his children, and one day he's going to glorify us. This now is looking to that future. There are two possible interpretations of this verse, in, of this phrase in verse 18. Let's read the verse again. 
the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Two possible interpretations. One, Paul wants us to fully realize what will one day be our inheritance. Okay? And that is true. We will be joint heirs with Christ. But the more probable interpretation is Paul's praying that we would realize that God views us as his inheritance. Have you ever received an inheritance? Are you looking forward to receiving an inheritance? Do you realize that God views us as his inheritance? We saw that in last week's passage. Paul's going to discuss it further in chapter 2. In fact, if you want to look over at chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together, made us sit in, together in the heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Tonight, after the game, trophies are going to be presented. And those trophies are going to go sit in a very prominent display case. I'm sure I've never been there to see it. I'm sure if you go to the Ohio State University, you will find a display of Big Ten championships and national championships, trophies. Let me ask you something. What did those trophies do to get there? Absolutely nothing. They were earned by those specific teams. One day in glory, we are going to be trophies in God's trophy case. We didn't do anything to deserve it. But we're trophies of what he has done with something like me to make me his child. I think that's what he's talking about here. His inheritance of us. But whichever view is right, whether it's looking at our inheritance in heaven, it's going to be there. Whether he's looking at us as being his inheritance, and that's true as well. The practical application is the same. We need to live our lives with the future tense of heaven in view. Our values need to be set on eternal things, not earthly things. Two specific requests. The third request for understanding is that we might realize the greatness of his power toward believers. And that's a request that deals with the present. We need God's power right now. Would you say amen to that? No, we need his power. Look at verse 19. And what, by the way, if you jump back to verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what, is the hope of his calling. Number two, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? And number three, what is, so that word what is a little hint, three different things. What's the third one? Now verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ? We'll go on with the rest of it in just a moment. Verse 19, we find the extent of God's power in the believer. What kind of power does he have available to us? Well, first of all, it is exceedingly great. Literally, the word exceeding means to surpass in throwing, to throw over or beyond something. Think about shot put competition or throwing a javelin who can throw farther than someone else metaphorically this word exceeding means to transcend to surpass to exceed to excel so what is excelling 
What is exceedingly great? Well, it is God's power. The Greek word for power is the, is the word where we get our English word dynamite or dynamo. It's speaking of God's inherent, innate power and ability. I have never personally watched dynamite blowing the top off a mountain. Okay? I don't know if any of you have ever watched that blast take place. But I've been to Mount Rushmore and I've seen the results of what happens when you place those charges on the right, you know, to get rid of a bunch of the rock before they start the fine work of carving it in. I've driven down super highways and turnpikes through mountains where they've cut the mountain apart with that kind of dynamite. I've gone through tunnels through mountains where they've cut right through the mountain making a tunnel. Pretty powerful stuff, right? How powerful is God's power? What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? How much power do we have at our disposal? Third, notice that power is working. Paul's here using a Greek word from which we get our word energy. It deals with power in operation. It's not just static power. A stick of dynamite has potential power. This is talking about that power at work. Think of the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going and going and going. In the New Testament, this word is only used of supernatural power. It's used of God's power. It's used of Satan's power. It's exceedingly great. It's power. It's working power. And then Paul adds the word mighty. That's the word that deals with physical strength, physical force. According to one commentator, it's power that overcomes resistance. And finally, he speaks of God's power, and that's a different word. It deals with might or manifested power. It's a word that's primarily used in the New Testament of God. So a different commentator sums it up this way. The transcendent, immeasurable, more than sufficient greatness of his dynamic power. Paul keeps up terms that defy description of speaking of God's power. If you wanted to tell somebody how great God's power is, what words would you use? But that's the power that's available to us. So after describing the extent of God's power in the believer, Paul goes on to share the exhibition of God's power, an example of God's power in Christ. Look at verse 20. His mighty power, the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Do you want a good example of God's power? You want a good exhibition of God's power? Look at Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, illustrations of God's power that were used included God's power in creation. From nothing to something. They use the example of God's power in the exodus, the plagues that brought Israel out of Egypt. But now we have an even greater demonstration of God's power, and that is God's power in Jesus Christ. Look at what God's power accomplished in the life of Christ. Four different things. You may want to add these. First of all, the resurrection of Christ in verse 20. If Satan could have kept Christ in the grave, he would have. But God is much more powerful than Satan. We have the resurrection of Christ. Secondly, the glorification of Christ. 
God raised Christ and then placed him back on his rightful throne in heaven. In Philippians 2, Paul writes that God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. God's power, the resurrection of Christ, the glorification of Christ. Verse 21, we have the authority of Christ. Jesus now has authority over absolutely everything, including angelic and demonic powers both now and for all eternity. Look again at verse 21. Far above, there's no comparison, okay? The best boxer in the world might do pretty well against any one of us, right? But if we get enough of us together, we could probably conquer him, right? The point that Paul's making here is Jesus' power is so far above all of the angelic powers that exist in all creation that even all together they can't even come close. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, talking about angelic ranks. Fallen angels are still in ranks. They just serve Satan, demonic ranks. Not only in this age, not now, but also that which is to come, the future. The authority of Christ, now and for all eternity. And finally, in verses 22 and 23, the preeminence of Christ. Jesus is the preeminent one. Everything is and will be subject to him, including the church. He's the head of the church. We're his body. So Paul wants us to understand more about the greatness of God's power toward us as believers. What's the application of God's power in our lives? Do you need that power? Do you ever get tired? Do you ever feel like, I just need to plug in and recharge? Two truths. First of all, that infinite power is at work in my salvation, assuring me that I will be saved. Folks, we didn't save ourselves. God's the one that saved us. We don't have to keep ourselves saved. That's God's job, and who's stronger than God? As John chapter 10 says, we are in Christ's hand, and God's hands over that, we're safe. That power is at work in our salvation. We don't have to worry about that. But secondly, that infinite power is also at work in my daily life, strengthening me, strengthening me to live as God desires me to live. When Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he's not saying that he alone could pick this church up. Okay? Well, that's one of the all things. No, I can do anything that God wants me to do <laughs> through his power. What does God want you to do? He'll give you the power to do that. Here's a question we need to ask ourselves. What is strong enough to stop me as I live for Christ and serve him according to his will? And the answer is nothing. The only thing that can stop me is me. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul puts it pretty bluntly in Romans 8. I love the whole passage. But verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer that he implies is no one, not even Satan. Earlier I referred to one of the commentaries written by Edward Rustio. Here's how he continues. We can depend on God's power. It is divine, inexhaustible, irresistible, and available. You get those words? It's God's power. It's limitless. It can't be stopped. And it's available to us. No one need ever complain of insufficient power to meet temptation, 
to overcome sinful habits or to live and witness for Christ, little power is an indisputable, indisputable evidence of little fellowship with Christ. Whew. Is that convicting? If we don't have power, it's our fault, not his. So let's wrap up again this morning with some practical lessons from today's passage. First of all, going way back to the beginning, I need to be demonstrating God's love toward all believers. Second, the, the overall theme of the passage, knowing God better will help me live better. And that's our goal, is to know God better. Not just facts about God, but experiencing Him in our lives. Third is the truth that my salvation is sure. Nothing can keep me from heaven. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's just as good as being there right now. Fourth, our daily life needs to be based on our heavenly hope, not this present world. Don't get so focused on what's going on politically, what's going on in our country, what's going on with the coronavirus, that you lose sight of what God wants us to do. We have a heavenly hope. And number five, I have all the power I need to live the Christian life. I just need to use it. That's the one that Paul spends the most time on. Do we really understand the power that is available to us? Open our eyes, Lord. What a prayer. It's a prayer that we need to personally pray every time we go to God's word. It's a prayer we need to pray regularly for one another here at the church. Are you asking God to give you spiritual understanding? Are you asking him to give each other spiritual understanding? Are you asking him to give your family spiritual understanding? Are you getting to know him better and better? And are you relying on his infinite power as you live for him? Father, we thank you for the enlightenment that we find in today's passage. Lord, open our eyes. Help us to understand better who you are. Help us to understand better how we can live for you and serve you. Father, strengthen us day by day to walk with you, to live for you, to share your love with others, but to grow in our relationship and fellowship with you. And Father, I pray that if there's someone here listening to this message that has never put their faith in Jesus Christ, that your spirit would convict that person of their need. I pray, Lord, that they would come to faith in Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is kind of an unusual one for closing day by day. But day by day, with each passing hour, we need the strength that God provides, don't we? If you're here with a spiritual need, you can just talk to the Lord where you are. But if you want someone to talk with you, pray with you, we're here to help. Let's stand together, please, as we sing. And day by day, with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trial. My father's one bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure, gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly is part of and pleasure. bear and cheer me, he whose name is Counselor and Power, the protection of his child and treasure, is a charge that on himself he lays, as you days your strength shall
shall be in measure this a pleasure me Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose no consolation offered me within your holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meet me, to take from a father's hand one by one the days of moments fleeting till I reach the promised land don't we have a great God he's there he wants to use us let's look to him for power as we follow him and serve him day by day let me encourage you to be back tonight. We're going to be taking just a step aside tonight from our series on one another. Let's just talk about praise tonight. It's going to be a praise service and our business meeting afterwards, and we're going to try to keep things short so you'll get out of here in good shape. What else is there to do anyway, right? You need to be in God's house. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you have done for us in our salvation, but Lord, for all that you do daily in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for that great power that is ours. Help us to grow in our relationship and understanding of you. And Lord, help us to look to you for power, to serve you as you want us to. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. We have a new closing chorus for the month. Make me a servant. Let's sing that together as we close this morning. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be. Make me a servant, make me a servant. Dismissed.